All right. So the stream should be live. And let's see, get this switched over here. Okay. We should be uh, streaming now. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Um, hopefully, everyone can see all of us and hear us. Um, if you have any trouble, then please put a comment in the chat window in uh, the IRC that's set up. Um, but anyway, welcome. Uh, I'm Deb Goodcan, and uh, this is the first ever FreeBSD Foundation Office Hours, and it's part of the um, FreeBSD Office Hours that have been happening over the last uh, four weeks. And um, and so anyway, we're excited to be here. And um, and so anyway, our goal today, uh, or at least over the next hour, um, is to answer questions that you have for the foundation. And, and one thing that I do want to note is um, I know a lot of people have uh, technical questions. They want to ask about things that are going on in FreeBSD. And, um, and so if we have any time at the end, we can answer questions. We would like to focus more on uh, the work that we're doing, the questions that you have for the foundation, as well as uh, work that you might like to see us supporting. So definitely, if we have time at the end, we, we'd like to hear that. So um, I will talk about uh, what we're doing and uh, the areas that we support. And um, I'd also like to support the team that I have on the call today. And, um, and then we'll take it from there. And uh, welcome any of your questions that you have. So to start off, uh, like I said, I'm Deb Goodkin. I'm the executive director of the FreeBSD Foundation. And I've been with the foundation for uh, almost 15 years now. I have uh, Justin Gibbs. And um, so I guess everyone can wave, yeah. Because <laughs> not everyone's uh, met us in person before. And uh, Justin is the founder of the foundation. Um, and he formed this charitable organization 20 years ago. And so he's currently the president as well as the, um, as the founder. Um, Ed Mast is also on here. He's also running um, all the, the tech going on. And, um, and so hopefully everything will work well. Uh, we do look at this as an informal type of office hours. And so understand that um, we're all working from home and uh, doing this call from home. And so things could happen. Kids could um, you know, come into the rooms, cats, dogs, um, older children. So we have them all. So, um, so hopefully you all will be OK with that. Ed is our um, director of um, project development, which uh, means that he oversees all of the software development work that we do. Uh, next, we have Lauren Gurkowski. And she's um, going to be the one who's going to be reading off all the questions that come into the chat window. Um, it would sort of be nice to keep the conversation in there, just two questions. but. And the only reason why I say that is because um, we may lose questions um, in the conversations that are going on there. Um, but anyway, getting back to Lauren, uh, she is the one who you talk to if you um, sort of have any foundation interfacing type of questions. So like travel grants and uh, trademark permissions. And, um, and so she deals with uh, all of those as well as um, helping us um, or ma oh, it managing uh, all of our um, donor management and accounting and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, next, we have um, Ann Dickinson. Wave. <laughs> She's our uh, marketing director, and um, and so basically she oversees all of our um, uh, marketing work. And and basically our marketing is really FreeBSD marketing. And so we usually refer to it as advocacy work. And it's it's basically all of the advocacy that we do uh, for the FreeBSD project. And um, and so we'll, we'll cover some of that too. Um, just to highlight a little bit about what we do. Um, so we're uh, distributed, we're uh, all around the world. We have eight board members and um, from uh, Japan to Germany to the UK to K 
here in the US. Uh, the foundation is based in the US. We're based in Boulder, Colorado. We have eight team members and so our um, eight staff members. And so those are the people who work for us either as um, employees or as contractors, just because we have people from around the world who uh, do work for us. Um, our budget this year is about 1.6 million. And, um, and uh, I could talk about that a little bit more later, but um, we, so 1.6 million, uh, more than half of that goes to software development work and um, a big chunk of that also goes to our advocacy work. So those are the two big areas that we focus on. Um, we are funded 100% by donations and grants. And so um, that 1.6 million has to be funded by, um, by outside organizations. And we do, we are starting to get into applying for grants. And, um, and we do recognize that this is gonna be a tough year for us. So, uh, so right now we stand at, um, at continuing to fund the projects and to add more. And in fact, Ed, um, Ed will probably go over some of the projects that we're funding right now. And um, that's, that's about it. I wanted to open up to any questions if we have questions. And so Lauren is gonna read any of the questions that are coming in and then we'll take turns answering the questions. All righty, let's see. First question I see here, uh, when working with vendors to try and get them to work together on something for free BSD, what's the process like? So uh, the process within the foundation would be, um, if we have contacts there, then we will uh, facilitate that collaboration between the different vendors. And so it may be, um, that's just, so for example, if it's two, uh, commercial vendors, then we will reach out to each and do introductions. And we'll also talk to each too first to make sure that they're okay with talking to each other. And um, and if we don't have any contacts at a company, uh, they may be new, um, yet we will try to work on finding contacts any way that we can. I think one of the interesting things about the foundation in dealing with uh, vendors, especially if they're new and not familiar with FreeBSD, is we have a history of working with vendors and their success and ability to um, make money off of uh, previous, you know, developments and things like that. And so I think when when it's possible for us to get those contacts and become engaged, that it's um, oftentimes uh, we're often in a in a pretty good position to provide them. Uh, sufficient information so they can kind of judge the business case. All right, let's see, I got another question here. Uh, how has COVID-19 impacted foundation activities? So, uh, so that's actually a really good question. Um, uh, we, so most of us work, already work from home. And so most of us were actually set up and so um, in that aspect, we weren't impacted that much. But we also had half of our team who work in Canada. And we had um, Ed, who was overseeing three interns who were very new to uh, working and working outside the university. And, um, and we had an office set up there. Um, actually, it was a really nice office. But you can imagine it was a small um, like a single person office with four tables and they're all facing each other. And so um, as the concerns uh, grew, uh, we realized that um, that wasn't gonna work and that they needed to be separated a little bit more. And we actually had put into place, um, so Ed worked with the interns to be set up so that they could work on their own at home. And so we had, uh, designated uh, uh, practice working from home day, and um, and it ended up being it was the first day that uh, the stay at home orders were put into place. So fortunately, um, it, they had set up um, okay, and um, and everything worked. It was hard, but um, but everyone was able to work from home. Um, unfortunately, we lost the ability to be able to 
work in more like a lab type of situation where um, Ed and actually Mark Johnson was um, in the office and we'd be able to work directly with the students when they had issues and, and help them along. So, um, so we, we did lose that ability. Um, as far as other situations, we've um, you know, we've stopped all travel and the last conference that we were at was scale and that was in early March and um, you know, it was sort of a, a nice conference to end with because we had a very successful uh, FreeBSD workshop there. We had a couple of FreeBSD talks. We had a FreeBSD buff and it was uh, very well received. And so, but, um, but we all flew back home and that's when the stay at home orders were uh, put in place. And so um, since then, uh, we've been trying to increase our online advocacy and we have how-to guides and um, we're uh, sharing more of the talks and we do have a few FreeBSD talks that will be given virtually, um, actually Open Source Summit, which is a big uh, open source conference. It used to be called LinuxCon that the Linux Foundation puts on. And so I'm giving a talk there and um, as well as LPI is doing a webinar series, which is new. And um, and so we'll be giving a FreeBSD talk there. So we're trying to do more advocacy online. And, um, and then I think the other area um, where is the fundraising. Now we ha have had uh, companies step in and commit to large donations. And so we have a few that should be coming in shortly. And, um, but it's more difficult reaching out to companies when everyone's working from home. And because uh, you you hesitate because you worry that um, they may be going through a situation, you know, a personal situation. You don't know what people are going through right now. And so um, so I feel like we're tiptoeing a little bit uh, around that. But as far as software development work, um, we have just kicked off, um, I don't know, four new projects and a couple more that we're getting ready to um, get going. So we have a lot of work that we're working on. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just uh, talk briefly about the, um, the co-op students, uh, I guess a little bit, um, just because um, for the last while we've had um, two or three co-op students for one term a year. Um, and it's, you know, it's a little unfortunate that this happened um, during the middle of, um, of one of the work terms, it would have been uh, if it was else, else if it happened another point during the year, um, it would have not have really affected us at all. Um, I would have just been working from home, um, and it would have been no big deal. But uh, it's also particularly unfortunate that two of the three co-op students that were working for me um, this term, it's their first uh, first work term ever, so they they've had you know, one or two uh, terms of university experience. Um, and then this is their first kind of working life experience and, and halfway through to end up, uh, to end up basically being forced to, to work from home halfway through. It's, it was definitely a, a struggle and, and, you know, was, was a, a very quick adaptation that uh, we had to try and do. Um, some of the projects also, you know, uh, as Deb said, we were, um, we had kind of a, a lab setup where we could interact directly, but also we had um, some of the projects using uh, embedded arm boards and things like that that um, are much more difficult to um, to easily when when you've got physical hardware that you're trying to tell people how to attach serial connections to and um, image SD cards and swap things around. It's a little bit more awkward, uh, so we we train change some of the projects that they were working on as a result of that. Great. Let's see. Next question here. Um, is there any work being done to get AMD and other non-Intel processor makers to help test and target FreeBSD as part of their certification workflows? Ed, you want to take that one on? Sure. Um, so we've we've had um, some discussions with AMD, and I hope that uh, we can um, we can move that um, move that forward. Um, we haven't had a lot of success yet um, with them specifically, but um, with uh, we, we've had some really good conversations with ARM, um, and have uh, 
with, with arm and some of the arm uh, manufacturing partners um so you know for for example um AWS just announced that they have uh, ARM-based instances available in their infrastructure now, uh, and FreeBSD um, is working on those through um, uh, through the the efforts of the community to uh, make sure that individual specific things that are, are are needed there are supported, as well as uh, foundation efforts from quite some time ago just to do general FreeBSD on ARM64. Uh, support. So I think it is, it's definitely the case that um, the foundation has been in talks with a variety of uh, semiconductor uh, CPU vendors to, to try and make sure that we're in, in, um, uh, in good shape. Uh, certainly AMD is uh, someone I would like to have a, I would like to improve our relationship with, with AMD for sure. Alrighty. Awesome. Um, Thanks for reposting a couple of these questions. Um, let's go with what is the stat? What is the status um, of 3MB, 3X, and base, meaning the client side of it? Do we pass on that question for now, just because it's not foundation related? Or I mean, I think it's um, it's something we can we can certainly talk to. Um, you know, I think. Uh, Deb's Deb's point is that there's no foundation effort um, behind uh, either a replacement or, or or anything there at the moment. Um, I think you know the SMB v1 uh, support that we have in the base system right now is not particularly useful for much of anything um, and should probably be just removed. Uh, I think you know it's it is something that's pretty important for FreeBSD um, and is a very large project. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's a, it's a good open question to see what, um, uh, what should happen there. Uh, I think Justin might have some thoughts on this topic too. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, um, I have worked on SMB in the past. Um, so um, to give a sense of the scope involved uh, in order for SMB to work well, you need um, LDAP, you need Kerberos, you need uh, pretty extensive um, enhanced leasing and locking semantics in the kernel for files. Um, there's, you know, a protocol involved that's layered on top of TCP IP or whatever your underlying uh, interface is. And then there's SMB on top of that. Um, and if you want to have high performance, you add RDMA. So um, as Ed said, I think that it's uh, something that is pretty important. Um, and I would love to see some members of the community just step forward to start putting some of the pieces in place. So uh, in the comments, there was some discussion about, well, Illumos um, may have started working on some SMB2 plus support. Um, Illumos um, is coming from Solaris already has enhanced um, uh, credential information, uh, credential support. So for instance, they can natively support Active Directory credentials in their file system and fetch that information from user space and cache it in the kernel and all those kinds of cool things. Um, they already had an LDAP implementation um, in order to be able to do that. Um, and then uh, I think it was Nexenta that started the SMB2 support um, that, would, um, that would layer on top of all of those other foundational pieces. So um, it might be interesting to look at the Illumos work and, and try to bring that stuff over. But I think that um, just in general, even some of some of the component pieces and having better support in FreeBSD for that uh, would be useful. Like Active Directory, native Active Directory support. Um, almost all the hyperscalers are using Active Directory in the back end somewhere in order to be able to manage all of their credentials. Um, so the the standard Unix model uh, isn't good enough yet. Uh, now I think in in corporate and hyperscaler environments. All right. Um... What are the long-term goals of the foundation? Um, well, that's a good question. I um, So one thing that we do is um, we meet, um, well, we meet, so as a corporation, we meet with the board once a month and we'll do a hour call, just to talk about what's going on and do a little dabbling in strategic planning, but we do most of our strategic planning uh, twice a year, once um, 
we do it in California in Berkeley. We try um, in January, February, and we did it February this year. And then at our annual board meeting, which is typically in Ottawa, and that happens in uh, June, typically. And we put together um, what we see um, where the holes, like where the holes are in FreeBSD, what needs help, and um, you know where the world is going in technology, and where we see FreeBSD in five years. We usually try to look at five years, and what we believe needs to be supported to, so FreeBSD is relevant, and um, and so we'll set those. Uh, goals based on that, and um, and we get input from uh, what we hear from talking to different commercial vendors out there. We talk to uh, universities that are doing a lot of research, and um, our board members are mostly hands-on, or and are also within the work that they're doing or um, what they're hearing too. We use that to inform um, what we decide to do, and so our long-term plan really is to support these larger um, software development efforts, which will make FreeBSD relevant in two years, in five years. And um, and it is, um, you know, and we adapt too, so it's not fixed. Right now we have a list of things that we're working on. We're funding most of those projects right now. Uh, we're also looking at bringing on another, uh, one or two more software developers who um, are willing to step in and, um, you know, want to, want to help us in the project and um and so the the work changes over time too and um and so we might have a meeting in february and then another meeting in june and uh, uh, the goals change and and that's okay and so that's how we keep on track um and, so, and really our longer term plans are just really i mean we're so we're a 501c3 and um and what that means and that's a u.s term, um, you know, IRS term. And what it means is that we're a, a public charity and we're really for the public good. And so our whole purpose is to support the project and the community. So um, so we, we keep our eyes open on what's going on and uh, where the project needs help. And um, we have no ambition to take over anything. And, <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, we're we're here to help, and um, and and one reason why I point out there that we're a five hundred one c three is that um, that we get compared a lot of times to organizations like the Linux Foundation and other foundations who um, are they're uh, called five hundred one c six organizations, and they're actually trade associations, and so their whole purpose is to support. Uh, corporations, and so that's why you see, like the Linux Foundation is membership list. They have tons of corporations that are members, and they're members so they could participate in the Linux Foundation. And um, and depending on the level of what they give, they could actually be on on the board. And uh, we don't have that. You can't buy a seat on our board. You may work for a company. Um, I mean, actually, here's a really good example. Um, so we had a person on our board a few years ago, Kylie Ling, and uh, and she worked for Microsoft. But we um, invited her to the board uh, because she was um, in China, and um, and um, we wanted representation in China. And she was actually getting uh, really involved in uh, FreeBSD. She was giving talks at the Dev Summit, so we thought she would be a really good addition. Um, she happened to work for Microsoft, but she she didn't bring Microsoft with her, so they didn't have a voice in what we did. So that was just like an example of that. So um, so hopefully that answered the question. I sort of went off track there. <laughs> that was good. So the next question here is about the journal. Um, and the question is, uh, is that is there any way to get statistics for how many people read the FreeBSD journal? And can these statistics be published? And, you know. Yes. 
It, we do. I'll take those down. <laughs> I figured you're going to find it my way. Anyway. Uh, so yes, we do have, uh, we can get download statistics of who reads the journal. We do get them occasionally from our publisher, um, and we're trying to get them more frequently um, and can put them in the quarterly status reports for sure as to what folks, how many folks are reading it. Uh, we purposely at this point don't have like a registration form so that we, we don't track, you know, the kind of people right now who are reading the journal um, because it's a free publication and we want it to go to as many people as possible. Um, there are challenges with registration forms, um, but we do want to, you know, use it as a tool to get the word out about the project and the work that they're doing. So um, once we get those numbers in, the most recent numbers, I'll work on getting it up um, both in the quarterly status and in a post to tell people how it's going. Great. All right. Our next question is many BSD user groups are active and many are being founded, um, particularly on Twitter. Will there be any initiative to connect these groups with the foundation or project websites, making it easier for people to connect with their local uh, FreeBSD users? So yes, um, I think that we already do our best to sort of retweet when we see that these meetings are happening and share on social media. Um, so the next step, you know, could be for us to put them on a website. I know the project website has, um, it's a bit outdated, I believe, sort of user group uh, page, um, but we can definitely put that on our, our site. Um, there are different sites. I don't run the project's website. Um, I only run our site, so I have control of that. Um, but yes, I think that having a place that we can connect folks and do more than just on social media is like something that we should do going forward. All right. Um, I read that the FreeBSD Foundation plans to purchase some newer hardware, including laptops for developers for helping to improve the FreeBSD experience on their new hardware. The first laptop they bought for focusing on improving is the 7th gen Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Carbon. Has this work continued and uh, what non-Lenovo laptops are being worked on? Ah, uh, Ed, you want to take that one? Yeah, so this um, the, the X1 uh, Carbon was our, our first um, foray into this, uh, this sort of effort. We bought it at the um the freebsd vendor summit on the west coast uh, uh, and mark johnston uh who's been working uh, for the foundation on a part-time basis uh, took it uh, took it with him and did did some effort to make sure that uh, the the hardware inside that uh, laptop works um so he he had a bit of work to do to get the wireless working um and uh, a number of minor things getting the the headphone uh, the audio uh set up correctly and and whatnot um so that that laptop is actually what we're using for the uh stream um here so this uh this stream is coming from uh obs running on freebsd on that x1 uh and it turns out actually using a usb to ethernet dongle as well um that's running a driver that one of my former co-op students uh, developed during his work term. Um, so there's uh, for the, the X1 Carbon specifically that um, that I've got. There's a little bit more work um, that needs to happen. Um, the microphones, uh, the, the built-in microphone in the laptop doesn't work uh, currently, uh, and there's there's some work that needs to happen to 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 come up with an entirely new uh, uh, driver to so, uh, sort of a superset of, of HDA um, in order to be able to get the microphone working. Um, and we also need to um, improve uh, the Wi-Fi support. I mean, so it's it's basically functional. Uh, it's functional at a basic level now, um, but the FreeBSD wireless stack in general needs uh, improvements and that work will, uh, will also benefit the this this laptop we're, we're limited um in the speed that we can get right now um on the the devices that are supported um but that said uh you know generally speaking um i use this as my daily driver laptop uh now and and it pretty much just works except for the the built-in mic um 
right now this is the the only laptop that we've we've done um in this this sort of effort to to improve things um we're, we're looking at some dell uh models that are popular as well but that basically you know finding out from uh the developer community which specific laptops are are of of interest um and people would like to buy i think is is a uh a good way for us to be able to move forward on those things Okay, let's see our next question. Is there a roadmap for jails and Linux emul emulation? Um, also, the MDB port was nice, but it seems to be stalled. So uh, for for the Linux emulation um, layer, we, um, we funded uh, Edward to do some uh, some work on some foundational improvements there to to make it easier to debug problems when running Linux binaries under the Linux emulator, uh, and we have a new um, a new grant coming up with Edward to uh, to start looking at the problem from the other side. Actually, looking at sort of taking the top uh, and um, interesting Linux uh, server use case applications um and looking at a number of uh desktop uh desktop applications and not necessarily making them all work but uh running them and figuring out what sorts of problems exist in the linux later now uh and figure out what missing functionality um is there that needs to be addressed if it turns out that you know there's minor things that are found during this process um they'll get fixed uh during the project and i think that you know we'll we, we would expect to see a number of project a number of applications uh start to work as a result of the effort that he's going to put in um, but we'll also have a much better understanding of what uh if any major gaps uh, are outstanding um when this is done Sorry, was there a second part of that question? Um, let's see. I'm just looking, scrolling up to see where the question was. So a roadmap for jails. Oh, right. Um, so mm -hmm. I think, you know, that um, I don't think there's a foundation um, specific kind of uh, roadmap um, here. The foundation is certainly interested in trying to advance containerization on FreeBSD. Um, and so there's certainly opportunities uh, for pieces to fit in there, um, but we don't have anything specific that you know we're trying to drive um, at this point. All right. I think we have a question on that. Um, let's see, I know jails are a great container solution, but in order to take advantage of the talker community and resources. Is there any plans to work on some kind of Docker compatibility in FreeBSD? Yeah, so that's one of the one of the things that um, that Edward is, is looking at when I said, you know, we're going to look at the top end applications. Um, that top end list is actually um, uh, being driven uh, by the popularity of things in Docker Hub. Um, so, you know, I think that's maybe a slightly orthogonal, um, uh, question. Um, it, it's not specifically Docker compatibility. Um, but I think it's, it, you know, it's definitely a related, um, effort and there's kind of three different ways that we could look at, um, when we, uh, when we, we talk about Docker on FreeBSD, what it means, uh, even if it's, you know, Docker with a capital D and not people using Docker as, as a, uh, the Kleenex of containers. Um, you know, I think, uh, running Linux applications, Linux, Docker containers, uh, verbatim using the Linux later is, is one way that, uh, it may be interesting to use, uh, Docker on FreeBSD. And, uh, I think that's, you know, that's one thing we'll, we'll definitely look at. Um, I don't, think uh we certainly don't have an effort right now uh to to make a kind of um drop in uh docker compatible docker command line compatibility uh or api compatible uh tool 
Great. All righty. What does the FreeBSD Foundation need from the community to have better FreeBSD advocacy and get more donations? Ah, uh, I that's um that's a really good question. Um, so let's see here. So what we'd love to see from the community would be um promoting what you're doing more and uh, promoting FreeBSD. So in different ways. So one would be I would say the top thing would be. Uh, giving talks. There's conferences around the world, and um, and it, actually most of them are virtual now, and so it's even easier, I think, to do it because you don't have to worry about travel. And but to give talks from introduction of FreeBSD to more specific talks at these conferences, and so I'm talking about more than just the BSD conferences. The, there's open source conferences all around the world, from FOSDOM to FOS Asia to um, it, it, there was a, a new one in Nigeria this year, and um, to uh, general computing uh, conferences. Uh, Usenex puts on a lot of conferences. So does ACM. And so, um, so you know, if you're willing to do it, um, you know, it also makes a name for yourself too. Um, but, but give a talk. We need more talks at conferences. Uh, write a paper. Write. We have the journal. Um, and so, uh, write about the work that you're doing or, um, you know, something that's FreeBSD related and we can share it. And so the big thing is having content that can be shared, um, in different, um, capacities. And, uh, the way to get donations would be, um, well, oh, let me backtrack real quick too. Uh, another thing that we're working on getting is, um, more case studies on companies. So from, testimonials, which we have on our website, to we just started writing up case studies, and so those are more in depth. And we just posted one on Mellanox, and we're working on our next one uh, with a, from a big corporate user uh, that should be available in, in the next couple of weeks. And so what that does is it shows other companies who, um, shows other companies, companies that are successfully using FreeBSD, and that's just so important to get that. So. So content, get content out there, write, talk, uh, promote, tweet, social media. And then as far as donations, uh, really, it's uh, if your company is using FreeBSD, uh, talk to them about uh, giving us money. Um, if you're not comfortable with us with it, uh, reach out to us and and give us the content, the con contacts, and um, and we will connect with them. And so we'll. Um, you know, if, if we're able to travel, then we'll actually try to meet too to talk about the work we're doing. Um, you know how how important it is to to give us money so we can continue the efforts that we're doing. I don't I know if I missed say, any. Um, yeah, I'll just Go jump on. in. One other thing: if you need help, if you do want to give a talk at an event, you need help with the prep or help with the slides, or you know, we can help you um, do that. So you just have to contact us, and we're able to help you sort of get started in, in giving talks. So one other thing um, that I think would be good to talk about here is that um, most of the people that we talk to don't know that there's an alternative. And so they go through life, you know, with their one hammer and everything is a nail. Um, so in when we have these opportunities um, at conferences and, and things like that uh, to introduce them to a new tool, um, one of the issues that we run into is the friction of adopting that new tool. And so I think it, it would be great for more folks in the FreeBSD community to think about uh, what are the barriers for somebody who is, you know, well um, versed in using Linux, or maybe they're they're new to computing in general, um, but they have access to um, to search engines and YouTube videos and things like that um, for alternatives that let them bootstrap quickly. Uh, we're missing a lot of that in FreeBSD. Um, and so this is um, everything from you know how you install for the first time or how you do something in a virtualized environment if you don't have a dedicated system to run on, um, how-to videos and documentation that's easy to find, um, and also that's that's um, that's visible like the project website, right? Um, if you convince somebody to to take the the chance to take a little bit of risk and try FreeBSD, you really want that first experience to be successful. And oftentimes, it's pretty hard for folks to, to do that, uh, even though 
if they put in that initial investment and they get through kind of that um, that initial that initial hurdle, um, they'll probably find a toolkit that will make them more successful later. Um, but we often have difficulty getting people to kind of get over that activation energy uh, and and to then become part of the ProBSD community and use ProBSD. All right. Let's see. How do I find a developer to implement a feature for money? Can the FreeBSD Foundation help with that? That's always a tough one. Um, I mean, what make the easiest route is always a developer coming to us who is willing to do work. Um, but I don't know, Ed. Do you want to take that one? That's something that we do talk about a lot. You're on mute. <laughs> one of the um, uh, the things I think here is it depends on uh what you mean about implementing a feature uh for money so um you know if you're looking um for something in a commercial context um you know you you really need um some project done on freebsd for a business purpose um you know there's uh there's companies that do freebsd consulting and 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 are freebsd contract houses that are familiar with FreeBSD. Um, and certainly, you know, you can come to the um, the foundation and sort of say, hey, do you know um, who these are? And, and you know, we can we can redirect you to um, to folks who are um, who are in that domain and, and can take on projects like that. Um, you know, if it's um, if it's if the question is, is sort of focused more on um, I think wireless support is really important in FreeBSD, um, you know, and is is lacking a little bit right now. And I'd like to help contribute um, to help support that. Um, then that's something that you know definitely you can um, you can just come to the foundation and say I think wireless support is really important. Um, and uh, you know I think independent of um, funding it that's something like that that kind of feedback about what needs to get implemented is is pretty important uh in any case um deb do you have anything further on that um the, the difficult thing is just if you want to fund a project um and you don't know someone who could do the work um yeah reaching out to us is okay it's just that we may also not know the right person to do it and so um so it's something that um, that so that model doesn't always work because of it. Um, if we have someone, so the example that Ed had, the Wi-Fi, um, that's a great example. If we do have someone who's implementing that work, um, and we're funding funding it 100% from the foundation, and so it works out well for us as uh, for uh, people or organizations who benefit from that work to uh, to co-sponsor that work. All right, our next question here um, is if, um, has the foundation considered reaching out to the existing creators uh, who are doing free BSD content on YouTube? And if not, um, they're offering to send links via email. So, um, so if we if we see content um, out there, we'll, uh, we'll social media it, so we'll, promote that work. Um, the foundation is actually uh, doing work internal. It's not like we have a lot of resources to do it, but uh, we have been putting together how-to guides and they're um, both text-based as well as videos. I think we have maybe three videos now. Um, it's something that we're trying to grow. And, um, and so we have some series we're looking at putting together. And, um, and so that's the route we're doing it right now. Um, it's just like the training that uh, we have some content that we've put together that we're sharing to other people to take that on. And so uh, I guess the way that we're looking at it is just encouraging other people to, um, to do their videos and do their tutorials and let us know. And then we're happy to share that. Cause we, I mean, in the end, we want more of that material out there and available. 
Um, and so even though we do uh, put funding into training um, and resources, we, we don't have a lot of resources to generate this content. And so, uh, so just to be able to share what other people are doing um, is the best model for us right now. Um, it's the same as far as teaching or, or running these workshops is that uh, we can't go all around the world and run these workshops. So what we want to do is provide the content, um, which we did on the um, it, uh, getting started with FreeBSD workshop and uh, just sharing it with people to that so you can teach this yourself um, in your region. And so one of the five of us, you know, aren't flying around the world just to teach it. So, so what we want to do is really just grow the base of, of people who are doing that. So we're not, so right now, um, even though we're working on content and we're also looking at maybe helping with some more uh, like university uh, curriculum material, uh, we're not going to, so right now we're not going to have like, be like the Linux Foundation, which um, which actually is a really good model for training material, um, but they have a lot of money to put into that, and so um, so right now we can't like have an arm of the foundation that's that's doing something like that. Um, I think though we'd be more than happy to um, to have links to content creators and and whatnot that. Um, you know, we're not aware of. Uh, certainly, if people are producing yeah. that, that that content, uh, definitely we want to know about it. Yeah, send them send them our way, and we can create a landing page for that information so that it's all in one place for folks to go and check out. And just to provide a little bit more color on the the training material and other stuff that uh, the foundation is trying to do, I think there um, are different levels of quality. So in the Linux community, it seems like there are enough content uh, providers. Uh, or people generating content just organically, that if I pick up some embedded board somewhere, there's probably some or whatever, and uh, perhaps there's good support by the vendor of that board, so there's an image. So my my the chance of me being successful is pretty high. Um, in FreeBSD, since we have less of that, I think for the material that uh, the foundation is trying to provide, um, we're trying to make sure that not only do we generate the content once and you know you can be successful at that point in time we're trying to make sure that we have uh something that's sustainable for the content that we provide so that when the boards get revised or whatever that the content gets updated um so it's so it's really um a pretty significant um effort and cost required for the content that we do choose to provide um that comes directly from the foundation All right, let's see. Uh -huh. Going off of that, would you happen to have instructions or tutorials handy for setting up development environment for FreeBSD development, both uh, base system and kernel? Um, and would you happen to have an example workflow for a person who would like to start contributing? Um, I don't. I don't think we have anything. Um, well, the for closest that. thing would be the the workshop, right? The workshop gets you close. It gets it's you not close. Completely there. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is a case where you know taking the amount the content that we've developed so far and kind of like our our base course that gets you up and running in a VM um, and things like that, taking it to the next logical step for some of these different workflows. Um, I think that's something that um, is in line with some of the efforts that we've done so far. It's just a matter of you know finding the time and and the people to generate that content and then also to support it. Um, are there any plans for FreeBSD to be compatible with the new Lenovo's T series laptops, the T14, 14S, and T15? So I have uh, I'm not familiar with those uh, those models uh, at this point. Um, right now, I think uh, generally speaking, you know, people are are pretty happy with um, 
the, the ThinkPad uh, line, and I, Alan was saying um, he's not sure if those uh, those ones are ThinkPads or if the, it's it's a different Lenovo series. We can certainly look and see. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a look and see what those ones are. Uh, our goal with the the project to buy um, current generation laptops and see what's needed to to make things work uh, well on them is, you know, to identify whichever laptops are, you know, so, some reasonable um, number of current generation laptops that are, are of broad interest in the, the FreeBSD community. All right. Oh, here we go. Uh, so if I wanted to start familiarizing myself with the getting started with FreeBSD course to try and pitch it locally, who would I have to contact to get the materials? Well, that's um, all on our website. So we actually have, um, so if you go to freebsdfoundation.org and you, um, the top menu um, on the far right says FreeBSD, and you click on that and um, you'll see we have how to guides, we have the install fest, um, and I don't know if, uh, so I'm not exact, exactly sure if we have the latest uh, workshop content, but you can always email us at, if, if you don't find it there um, at info at freebsdfoundation.org and we'll help um, get you set up. We'll also make sure that we, we put the content there. I know that uh, with the last workshop uh, that was, uh, we, I worked with a Roller Angel on that content, and so we've left all of that on his website. And so, um, so that's something that we just need to link to. Let's see. I think that's it so far with questions. Any others? All right, I'm not seeing any more. Okay, well, let's keep thinking about your questions that you have for us. Um, in the meantime, we could, there's some projects that we've been working on internally, and um, and so I thought maybe Anne could talk about the uh, FreeBSD Mythbusters, that sort of a fun project that we've been working on. Sure, so um, what we're going to do is we've been working to pull together some of the top myths you hear about FreeBSD. Um, everything from, you know, oh, it's dying to, as Deb mentioned, it's a trade organization or the foundation trade organization. The project is dying. Uh, we don't, you have to build everything from the beginning. You can't use packages. There's a, a number of myths that are floating around and we are doing our best to compile them together and um, bust them, as Deb said. So, uh, we'll be doing this in a video format as well as um, on our website and just we'll have folks on to talk about you know these myths and and, and to debunk them um, and so it's just a good way to share with folks um, you know that FreeBSD a lot of things the rumors that you're hearing about FreeBSD are true and we can you know point them at a place that they see <laughs> it's all here so that's sort of our Mythbusters project. All right, it looks like we've got a couple new questions. Um, starting with the first one um, about the upgrade process um, for FreeBSD being painful. Um, and they're wondering if they're missing anything with it. Um, they've checked the merged configuration files, um, are okay do doing a manual process, removing conflicts. And this is server B server, uh, any future new approach to do um, to improve the process. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that's probably a um, it's it's a 
question of the FreeBSD project more than specifically the foundation. Um, although definitely we would um, be interested in improving, uh, helping to support uh, efforts to improve things there. Uh, I think, you know, with the specific instance of, in the specific case of, um, of upgrades and con conflicts and configuration files and such, um, the real path forward for all of that is um, the package base uh, effort. And, you know, I think that's, um, uh, that's entirely a community driven um, effort. All of the, the, the work and design um, is, is from within the FreeBSD community. Um, and so, you know, I think we're, we're definitely interested in and, and willing to help sponsor efforts there if, if necessary. Um, and I think that's that's how uh, the upgrade process on FreeBSD will um, will move forward. Great. Um, wondering if it is possible to organize an online dev summit. We've talked about. I mean, I'm part of the team that works with the works on the organizing for the Dev Summits, um, at least the BSD CAN one and the uh, Bay Area one. And we've talked about how that might uh, work um, since it's unlikely we're gonna have any in person, um, but it may be very similar to sort of this office hours kind of thing um, with more focused themes, kind of like this one is focused on the foundation and we're hoping to expand on that. Um, but we haven't really gotten back together to talk more about it because um, we we're all kind of waiting to see what was gonna happen <laughs> with in-person events. Um, so uh, we definitely, that's a conversation we need to have uh, going forward because uh, the next one would have been uh, Bay Area in November and that's probably unlikely. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll work on it and see what we can do. Uh, if you have suggestions on how you'd like, you know, what you think make a good version of that or what you've seen that's worked, because um, I know other organizations are having online summits right now, send them my way um, so that we can sort of look into it and see what makes the most sense for our community. And I think uh, you know one of the uh, one of the reasons that we're um, we're doing this this sort of um, uh, you know the foundation is participating in the, this office hours and I think it's uh, as far as the project is concerned you know one of the reasons that we're doing this sort of thing as a project in general is is to um, explore those kinds of ideas for how we we could do a um, a dev summit or or any other kind of um, uh, any other kind of effort like that. Uh, I think, um, you know, it would, uh, it would be, uh, it'll be very, um, very useful to, um, to have focused, um, you know, one or two hour sessions on, uh, on topics. I would very much like to, um, you know, for, for BSD can, we would have had a package base, um, uh, session in the dev summit and, and certainly doing an online, um, package base uh, session would be something that would be be quite interesting to do. Yeah, we actually well, actually, Anne had an idea this morning on uh, doing a um, uh, install fest over Zoom, where we did we run the workshop we ran uh, back at scale, and. The reason why we might choose Zoom is because then we can have breakout rooms. And so if someone needs like extra help, they can go, I don't know exactly how it works, but, uh, but you know, so that person get extra help um, and not interrupt the rest of the, the class that's going on. And, and so then anyone could take it and we could uh, probably record it too. So then it's available, but it would be a fun way to, um, yeah, do do this multiple times um, at different times, so you know people in various uh, time time zones can participate and get people installing FreeBSD, and then maybe there's either in a you know separate mailing list or something where people can ask questions. I mean, we haven't thought through it, but um, you know, but there are these ideas of of doing um, like some of the office hours could be. Um, I think uh, Benedict had suggested doing like a how to uh, contribute documentation, which I think would be a great thing to do. So it's sort of like this hands-on, step-by-step, um, 
hour of getting set up to contribute documentation. So, so besides like an actual Dev Summit, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to do these, expand on these online office hours that we're all doing. Yeah, and I did post in the chat here, the um, we have a wiki page that has a place where you can, if you have one you want to do, um, you can, you know, post that here and we can you have a focus top, but you have to host it. <laughs> you can't just put an idea of what you want to do. <laughs> you need to be in charge of it. Um, we can have someone facilitate it for you, do the, you know, the background ed stuff and stuff Alan typically does. But um, if you have something that you would like to run, a topic you would like to speak on, then um, at least put it in here and then we can go forward from there. Our next question, um, has the foundation considered targeted grants to improve specific areas of FreeBSD as opposed to the current model that's more freeform? And then what input from the project would the foundation need to undertake this? So I, I, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. I mean, we do targeted grants for specific projects for work that needs to be done. So for example, the Wi-Fi work that's being done right now, that would be a targeted grant. I'm not sure if you're asking um, if the community, if we did like a um, uh, earmarked type of donations where you could say your donation is going towards this type of work. Um, we've thought about doing that in the past. Um, it is hard for us to, um, to manage that right now. And um, and and also just allocating the funds. I mean, most most of the funds that come in uh, do go to the software development projects that we're funding, as well as our internal um, developers and staff members. And uh, but we need um, you know more money to help with the overhead, not the overhead of as like running a company, but the overhead of like going to conferences and traveling, and uh, which isn't a lot, but uh, but we do need the yeah, the money, money to go to our general funds too. I'm not sure if that answered that question or not. I think one of the um, one of the related things um, is that um, you know for uh, for BSD Can every year, the foundation and core have a um, a meeting where we uh, we get together and and make sure that we're on the same page on various things. And um, that'll happen again this year virtually. Um, and I think that's one way that, you know, we can get feedback into the um, into the foundation um, from CORE as the representing the, um, the project's goals. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, part of that question, um, do you have a page for projects that you're looking to fund um, as opposed to targeted donations? Yeah, we, we don't. We currently don't. Um, I, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, basically, the way we do it right now is uh, we know uh, the type of projects we do want to fund, and, um, and in certain cases, we will go out to different companies who we believe will benefit from that work and ask them if they'll co-sponsor a project. All right. So we're, let's see, were there any more questions? So we're on a little past the hour. Uh, I, we can go a little bit longer, um, but we should probably end this soon. I know there's a delay between getting your question in. I guess we should just ask for last questions to come in now. Mm. Not seeing any yet. Okay. <laughs> And, and I think, and these have all been really good questions and, and I'm sure you have more. Um, I mean, one thing I would love to talk about, but we don't really have time is the software development projects we're funding right now. And and I, I see this 
us doing that in another office hour. And so then you get asked specific questions that are related to those projects as well as um, you know, getting your input on uh, projects that you uh, think that we should be funding. So we're always looking for input like that. Yeah, I think doing a focused uh, session specifically on the projects that are in progress, the projects that um, have been suggested, um, et cetera, would be a, a very useful um, one to do. Have the um, have all the developers that are currently working on project grants um, be on the, the call and uh, on the, the meeting and be able to answer questions about what they're working on and and um, ask for you know discuss ways that people can help and test and things like that it looks like we had a follow-up question to the last one of um, Do you have a list of projects that you're looking for bodies to do funded or not? So I think that's something that um, really uh, we need to do in collaboration with the core team um, to basically kind of uh, discuss, you know, the um, both the small and big ideas um, that need to happen in in FreeBSD. Um, that uh you know that that either the foundation can can take some of those to sponsor and and make happen or can just encourage uh folks in the community um to pick up uh pieces and i think that's something definitely that will be a um a good topic for the the upcoming uh core and foundation uh, meeting Okay, I think we take one one last question here. Um, Lauren, I'm not sure it's showing you're frozen. I mean, the last question I see, and, and I think we could um, spend a lot of time on this one, but it's a good question. It's asking for a Linux person, what are the main reasons one might want to learn or move to FreeBSD? So, um, I mean, this is, this is something that we try to answer a lot in uh, different formats. Um, and so it depends on what that Linux person is doing. Are they a developer? Are they a user? So, um, and, and other people could jump in on this. I mean, for me, uh, um, you know, uh, so here are some of my top reasons. And it's regardless if you're a developer or user, but the community. So. Um, I view the community as very uh, welcoming and um, you know, nice, helpful. So, and I say that because I see it on a um, on mailing list. I see it on there's a Facebook user page that uh, people step in and give answers to. They could be the most simplest questions. And so you could say, well, have you read the handbook? And I don't see that. I see people stepping in and giving suggestions. I mean, they may say something like, um, oh, that's actually described really well in the handbook. I would recommend that you go read it. And you know, so it so it's always like constructive feedback in a positive way. So um, so that's where I'm basing how I see the community. So and then also with my relationship with the community, it's been it's been great um, for people who uh, want to learn about operating systems. I mean, FreeBSD is an awesome operating system to learn from. First, the you know the the code size is much smaller than Linux, and so you can actually go and read the code. And what is it? It's like five million lines versus like thirty-five million lines if you compare the kernel. And so it's a great way to learn about um, operating systems. It's a great way um, if you're into system programming to uh, get your hands dirty with that. And um, the third um, reason I would say is. Um, that if you want to get involved with the open source project, uh, being a smaller project, but also you know we've been around for a really long time, and um, so you can participate in it and actually talk to people who um, you have been with the project since the beginning, and they're approachable. But you can also make a notable difference, and so there's a lot of opportunity to step in and uh, work on something, and you could eventually 
uh, be the expert on it. And so, uh, so you don't have that layer, the layers of lieutenants for, for submitting code and getting it approved. Um, and so it's easier to get your contributions accepted. And, um, but also just to, you know, um, make a name for yourself. So those are, those would be sort of my top three reasons. And if, if anyone else wants to, I know everyone, I mean, you could probably add comments here. And, and actually, I like that because um, when we go out and give talks on FreeBSD or we staff tables, uh, people will ask that same exact question. And so, um, and so having, getting input from others of like, well, why do you like FreeBSD? Most people have tried Linux or, you know, they, um, they move from Linux. And so what, were, what are your reasons? And so I love hearing that. Uh, does anyone else want to add their reasons? So I'll, I'll go next, I guess. Um, um, you had me at control T. <laughs> um, and, um, but, but I mean, being more serious than that, I mean, control T is great and everything. And most Linux people don't even know what you're talking about when you tell them about SIG info and things like that. But, um, uh, the biggest thing for me, um, going above and beyond the, the community itself and, and the quality of the system that we have to work on is just the, um, because it is a complete system and it hasn't been fractured into a million different distributions and things like that, that, um, you have a lot more um, options uh, at your disposal about what you want to do. I mean, if you want to work on documentation of the system, well, you can certainly do that. Or if you want to uh, build something new that requires close collaboration between the kernel and user space, um, you, you just can't do those kinds of projects easily in the, in the Linux space. I mean, Linux is, after all, just a kernel. And it's a kernel that um, isn't really innovating. Um, it keeps on getting more stuff but it's not really innovating. And so in many of my conversations with people who are trying to build complex systems, they do all of that work outside of the core system because they can't rely on the core system anymore. Um, and that system is Linux, right? Um, so in my day job, uh, working at a hyperscale company, uh, there's a team of people that try to maintain the kernel that's used by the fleet of machines, uh, but it breaks all the time. Um, and, and that's even though we have 10 or 20 people that are probably trying to make sure that it doesn't break. Uh, you just don't hear about those types of experiences for people who are trying to deploy FreeBSD. Um, and, and certainly, again, when you try to talk about innovation, uh, there's several projects that are going on inside FreeBSD that would be just hard to contemplate on Linux as it is right now, either because of the quality of the technology that's there or the people who are involved in the ossification of it. Um, so if you're an outside contributor, you know, since the, the community is kind of driven by, um, if you, if you bring it, you can land it kind of mentality, right? If you come and do the work, um, you can become the expert in any spot. You can innovate in any spot. Um, there's a little bit of a barrier to entry. You know, you have to actually show that the idea has merit and things like that to the broader community. But there isn't a general or a lieutenant who's going to sit there and say, oh, I see this as a threat and prevent you from doing it. Um, so I think that uh, the story behind FreeBSD is, is really compelling. We just have to make it easier for people to, to see those benefits, to be able to come in and be effective. It really needs to be the toolbox that is right there. It's trusty. Nothing's rusted. I can just open it up and I can get to work and I can ship my product, ship my service, um, and it just works. Um, and if I really am creative or if I want to do research, that it's also a great toolbox for that. Um, so that's kind of how I think of as, as the difference, right? On my day job, I don't do anything in the operating system anymore. It's just this thing that uh, boots my computer. Everything else is done in user space because I don't have the ability in that environment to actually do it in the operating system. I think it's very different when you allow people to do stuff with FreeBSD. You're muted, Deb. Oh, that was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> I was just saying that the comments are uh, sort of cute. So, um, and Ed, do you want to add anything? And, and then we'll finish up our office hours. Yeah, so I think I have a little bit of an interesting perspective um, because I've had new people um, come to FreeBSD via the, the co-op student um, effort that we've had, uh, who generally speaking, um, I think all had no FreeBSD experience beforehand. Uh, some of them had, had Linux, Linux experience and, you know, they, um, I, and I think we've, we've had uh, probably 10 different students um, come through now, you know, and, and it's uh, on, on day one, um, I give them a, a desktop PC and a USB stick and they've got to uh, get FreeBSD up and running so that they can start doing their work. And it's always a, um, you know, a challenging experience at the very beginning um, for them to get going. And when, when they don't, don't have background there, but, you know, it's a four month work term that, that UW does. And by the end of it, they've all uh, sort of become amazed, I think, at how they've been able to contribute to um, to making FreeBSD better. And, and I think almost all of the co-op students that I've had uh, come through have submitted by uh, tags on commits that are in the, the FreeBSD source tree um, now. Uh, a couple of them have gone on to stick with FreeBSD and are still um, still committers, uh, have become committers and, uh, and have stuck with FreeBSD since being co-op students. But I think, especially for anyone who is interested in learning about systems programming, uh, FreeBSD represents probably the best place to do that um, these days. And I think one of the really interesting things is, um, you know, there's, it, it's a good quality, uh, well-designed operating system, um, but there's still lots of opportunity to kind of find something that's of interest to you and, and make your mark on it, um, which is is not the case everywhere. And so I think, you know, for, for folks that are interested from that perspective, FreeBSD is uh, is a great place to to do it. Okay, well, um, I think our time is up, and um, I want to thank my team for stepping in and um, answering questions, and um, I want to thank all the people who have joined us. And I'm happy with the turnout and um, and the questions that we received and. Remember, it's not the end. You're always welcome to email us um, either directly or info at freebsdfoundation.org and ask your questions. I mean, we we are here to support you folks. So our whole purpose is to support you. So um, so please feel free to um, you know to ask questions. We may not get back to you right away. Um, you know, there, there aren't a lot of us and, um, and, and, um, our schedules are impacted, um, by COVID-19 in different ways. And so, um, so it's caused, um, us to work different hours and, um, but we're here, we're still all working full time, uh, to support you. So, um, so again, thank you. And I think, uh, you know, maybe in two, four weeks, we'll do another office hours and, and we'll have it focus more on other projects that we're supporting now. So, so anyway, so thanks. And goodbye. <laughs>